it takes a second. All right. Hello, Travis. Hello. How is everybody doing? Good. Great. So we're going to give it like another minute or two, and then we're going to jump right in. Um, kind of before we get going, um, I'll probably go over this again anyways, but there is, the, if you have questions, please use the chat at the bottom of the screen. Um, feel free to kind of ask any questions throughout, just type it in. I'll kind of be passing them along to Mark as we go. Um, once we get going, I do ask that everybody turns off their microphone to make sure that's off so there's no background noise. Um, yeah, I mean, that's kind of the basic thing, kind of as we're going, if you want to use the chat, it's always nice to see where everybody's coming from. So feel free to type in where you're at, just so we can get a kind of idea where everybody's, everybody's hanging out. Give it another, another minute. see some see some see some pretty faces out there that I haven't seen in a while it's always good to see people yeah during the talk you're more than welcome to turn your video on if you want sometimes I think people's internet turns tends to work a little better with it off but if you want to have it on um, I know this is probably a time where everyone loves to see other people's faces you know it is these I've been really great just to be able to see other people and so you're more than welcome to do that but don't feel obligated if you just want to hang out and listen. There's Mark. Someone's talking. Switch to the gallery. All right, so uh, we're going to just go ahead and get started. For those of you who just joined us, um, I'm going to kind of reiterate again, if you have questions, feel free to kind of put them through the chat. Um, as we're going, I do ask that you keep your microphones off just so we don't end up with the background noise. Um, you can see people are kind of in the chat right now kind of seeing where they're coming from it's awesome to kind of see where everybody's tuning in from so feel free to do that um, the one thing with the chat is please make sure it's coming to everyone uh, it should already be set to send to everybody um, just make sure that it's set up that way because sometimes it'll only send to certain participants and not the entire group um, yeah so thank you for tuning in these have been super wonderful. It's always, it's really been such a treat to see how many people are able to get in here and see these artist talks. Um, I think they've been really great because we're able to kind of get people from, I mean, we've got people from California, DC kind of coming from all over. I think these have been really wonderful. Because these are opportunities that you really don't ever get. Uh, this is the kind of one blessing of this entire pandemic that I can kind of think of is kind of being able to get tuned in a little bit more and kind of see different artists talk, which usually you don't get a chance to unless you're at wherever they're giving the talk. So this is a really great kind of time. Um, yeah, I'm sure most of you know today we've got Mark Arnold here with us talking at his studio in Elizabeth City, North Carolina. Yes. All right. So Mark is a potter currently in Elizabeth City, North Carolina. He has got his BFA from Edinburgh University and his master's degree from the University of Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. And I am this guy for too long now. He was my roommate when I was in grad school, so I know him pretty, pretty well. We've had some good times together. <laughs> Probably too many good times together, but yeah, so thanks for being here, Mark. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's great to see. I haven't even seen your new studio space, so this is kind of awesome to get a chance to see what's going on and kind of what you have going on. Um, 
So kind of to start out with, I just want to ask you kind of a few questions, kind of what you've been working on, kind of how you've been dealing with this pandemic. Um, so what have you kind of been working on to get you through kind of this time? I know I'm sure you've had a lot of cancel as you're, I mean, you've been teaching college classes, you've had, I'm sure you had a ton of workshops scheduled and stuff. So how kind of have you been dealing with this and how has it affected your studio practice? Um, yeah, definitely pretty much everything for this year was canceled. So that was kind of a little bit to kind of understand how I was going to make it through after that. Um, but yeah, just been working in the studio and trying to do housework and stuff. It seemed kind of time to do that. Oh, we got someone else. Oh. Well, I'm glad you've got a house and you've got a studio to work in. Yeah, I definitely feel fortunate to have that. And we're on about, we don't own a ton of property. It's about a quarter acre, like our backyard is. And I have my studio here, and then my wife, Caitlin, has her studio in the house. Nice. And yeah. then, it's, I mean, I know, I mean, you kind of relied pretty heavily on workshops and stuff, and I'm sure this is like greatly affected kind of your, what you do. I mean, have you seen kind of a, Thing with sales kind of things with all of that changing kind of jumping to online or kind of you I mean do you have anything going on during this even um a couple of weeks ago I did a sale and donated 50% of the benefits to the local food bank uh well put 50% of the sales not benefits <laughs> um, yeah just trying to figure out how to sell online I've most of my sales have been like usually in person so switching to online's definitely been a learning curve yeah and i know we talked before kind of everybody jumped on i know you're doing at least one online workshop which hasn't happened yet so i can't ask you how that went but um, i'm <laughs> yeah, sure i'm kind of interested in hearing about that and kind of you know how does that work yeah so i'm doing a series of three workshops um through i was a resident at Picosan arts it's a small craft school um much like touchstone and um, I still work for them one day a week. And they, um, we came up with the idea of doing a series of like three workshops. So I'll be doing one tomorrow that's um, how I make my plaster molds and uh, my mugs. And then next week I'll be doing bowls and teapots. And then the following Saturday I'll be doing um, terracage and like surface. Cool. So. Hey. If people are interested in that, where would they go to find out about it? Um, through uh, PicosanArts.org. Or if you contact me on Instagram, I could send you a link. Um, see a couple of people in here that are actually signed up for it tomorrow. So Great. It's going to be kind of nice. <laughs> yeah, I might have to talk to you after to see kind of how that goes. With I mean, it's definitely a different format than a regular workshop. You know, I think a lot of... The great thing is about workshops are really being in, getting to like interact with the people so it's kind of an interesting interesting dynamic of how it's going to work so i will probably get a hold of you sometime yeah we did a test run for it today and um i was showing travis earlier i have my computer on um furniture moving carts so I can actually like shift it around to where i'll be working at and um because i move around a lot when i work just because I have a bad back, so it's, I don't like to be hunched over at the wheel all day. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Well, I think this is a great time for you to kind of show us around your space. It looks like you got an awesome shelf of your work in the background. So you want to kind of give us a little tour of your studio? Maybe, I know we have a couple questions about your methods of your work, which I don't know if are really in your presentation or not, but. Yeah, um, let me figure out how to share my screen again. I'm really computer illiterate, so this is <laughs> makes it probably more of a struggle. I think a lot of us has probably learned a lot about technology that we did not expect to in the last few months. So, what the? So I don't know where the screen went. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
Go away. There we go. So there's my view right now. <laughs> um, with the speakers on here, I don't think I can um, go outside and you can hear me to show you the outside, but I have an image of it in my presentation, so. Yeah, definitely everybody should check out Mark's Instagram because he posts pictures of the outside of his studio, which is just as nice as the inside. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so the door, I put a doggy door on. <laughs> uh, I put a few dogs and I got tired of them knocking and just constantly wanting in and out. Um, I got my pottery wheel, the always needed cat calendar. <laughs> Um, I'm pretty organized, so like I didn't really have to stage the studio much for this. It's um, I don't know. If you can come in here every day, and it basically um, I clean up as I'm working. So I try to have everything like organized and hanging. Um, I have a TV. <laughs> so this is my workstation, like work table, and then all the plaster molds that I work out of down underneath. Um, yeah, and then just more tools. All my surface is terrace gelato. So it's kind of nice. Um, I can keep everything in like smaller containers. It's one of the things um, setting on my own home studio I didn't really think of was um, how much like materials can take up in your space and my process actually lets me be pretty um keep everything kind of compacted and organized i got some shelves with some finished work here um some of the wooden press molds that i work out of these are some new collaborative pieces that my wife and i have been working on um, their first show next month. So this kind of shows up today. Um, these are all some finished seconds. I had an issue where um, but I'm not I was getting like some pop outs with my clay. But I was able to contact Sander and they were nice enough to swap out the clay for me. Can you guys hear me? Uh, <laughs> um, sink and exhaust fan. I just installed that because it was, my studio would be about 100 degrees when I fired my kiln. And since I installed that, it stays down to about 65, 70 now. Two little kilns. And then there's another shelf. Um, full of finished work. So. You're muted, Travis. I can't hear you. Oh, there we go. Yeah, I was just talking, saying that like you have such like an organized space. Um, are you always that organized with everything, or is it just kind of you really adamant in keeping your space, you know, easy to work in without having to deal with a mess? Um. Yeah, I think I'm, like since I got my, I think from being in school and just having like a shelf. I had to learn how to be organized to like keep a lot of work on it and not overflow in other spaces. So it just kind of like carried over from studio to studio. Um, when I was in graduate school, I remember getting made fun of because I'd like sweep and mop my studio floor every week. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I still do that in my home studio. Um, I'm kind of happy that I kept up those habits just because, um, now being in my backyard, if I go in the house and I'm just covered in clay all the time, then everything in the house just turned red. So. Yeah, I mean, that is one thing with working with red clay is it always looks dirty. It's very, very hard to keep things looking clean. Uh, I know you did talk, do you use standard clay with 
your work? What kind of clay are you using from it? I use a standard 104. It just has red clay on it. Um, I fired a cone for And then I use um, just one liner glaze and then one base of terra sids that I add mason stains to for the color. Yeah. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about sitch kind of before we jump in your talk? Give kind of, I don't know if everybody kind of knows the background of what terra sidge is and kind of what you do with it. So. Yeah, so um, terra sid gelata, terra means earth and sid gelata means sealed. Um, so it's basically just really fine clay particles that seal the outside surface of a pot. And then I add um, mason stains to it to color it and um, give me the finished surface on the pieces. Nice. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, you get really nice. Kind of, you've got a lot of texture going on in your work. I think the terra sidge is like a really nice nice surface to kind of put over that without kind of covering it up when you, a lot of people think about pots as being fully glazed but your work isn't you know it's got that kind of different surface quality with using the terra sidge versus kind of glazing the whole pieces yeah it's just um i mean it really just actually helps me save space now that i have such a small studio like it's just something i've never thought of until now at um i mean and i have a dozen of the Terrasidges up on the wall, like right there. <laughs> and if I had a, that probably gets me through um, two kiln firings. And I do have someone asking if you can show them like a sample of this seed? Do you have Do you have like a bone dry piece of it on it? Um, I don't have a bone dry. I have some finished pieces. I know you'll probably have some of that in your presentation too. So. So why well. use why use terra sidge versus regular slip? Um, it has more of a waxy feel to it when um, slips tend to be a little bit drier. The terra sidge just um, yeah, it doesn't have that softiness to it or anything. Yeah, I mean, I think terra sidge definitely has kind of that nicer surface quality to it to touch. Definitely with pots, it's something you're really handling quite a bit. Um, so I think you want something that is going to be a little nicer to hold on to. So I think a terra sidge is like a really nice option for working with your pots. Um, I know your work has changed a lot over the years. Um, I get bored very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, I think hey you have such like a nice organized space and i really i mean i kind of know you seem to make quite a bit of work um which is probably help, very helpful to have a nice kind of clean studio space as well so with your terra sidges are you burnishing them at all when you put um, them? just paint them I, and leave them i lightly burnish them with a plastic bag um not more for the sheen but just trying to scratch a surface just to add an extra layer Oh, um, Travis is gonna laugh. <laughs> but um, I use I've been using this bag since I started using Sidge about six years ago, and it's um a takeout bag from Buffalo Wild Wings. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to I would like to everyone to know how much you love Buffalo Wild Wings. Um, I know a lot about the Buffalo Wild Wings with you, so. I do love the Pittsburgh in mat at the door. <laughs> it, um, when I was in grad school, Buffalo Wild Wings was the place to go to get away from art students and watch sports. So it um, kind of became my place to go. <laughs> yeah, those, for those of you out here, Mark is a pretty big uh, sports fan. Um, He's, well, if any of you tuned into my presentation and heard about me talking about my roommate that dressed his cats up, um, Mark is that roommate that put clothes on his animals. So um, I, I definitely got to thank Mark how he inspired my work for sure. <laughs> that was Ernie. <laughs> we do got one more question about your seed. So uh, what percentage of mason stains are you putting in it? Um, I use anywhere from one teaspoon to four teaspoons per cup. Right. So, and I have a recipe list. I'm welcome to share if, anyone, if there's a way to send it to anyone that would be interested. Um, 
all of my recipes come from like Pete Pinnell and Linda Arbuckle. And I feel like they share more than pretty much anyone in the field that I shouldn't be hiding their secrets. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. I use Pete Pinnell's sage recipe myself. So um, yeah, I think if anybody is interested, I'm sure if you email Mark or shoot him a message, he'll be more than willing to kind of pass that information along to you. Um, what kind of at this point I'm going to have Mark jump in to giving his talk about his work. Sweet. <laughs> it's weird. I'm not getting confused because it's not bouncing to me when you're talking or whenever I'm talking. But I don't know. <laughs> you're, the, you're the center of attention right now. So. All right. Um, share screen. Sweet, here we go. Oh, I can still see you, Travis. This isn't as creepy as you made it sound. <laughs> All right, so um, like we were talking about, my name's Mark Arnold. Um, Travis gave me the nickname as, of Marnold. Um, but I was born and raised in Pittsburgh. Um, pretty much everything about a lot of my work is based off of Pittsburgh. Um, and I didn't really have a chance. I was a Super Bowl baby. So the Steelers won a Super Bowl when I was born nine months later. Um, <laughs> so what, that's kind of where my obsession came with it. Um, I was just born with it. Um, so growing up in Pittsburgh, um, this is what I was used to seeing every day. So my dad worked for the um, – Railroad, my grandfather worked in the steel mill, and I thought that's just what I was going to go into as a profession, like some kind of industry in the city. Um, so when I was in high school, I started an apprenticeship program, and I was working for Pit Tool and Die, and we made, um, I was running the CNC routers and CNC lathes, and we were making um, plastic injection molds for Tyco and Play School. Um, but unfo not unfortunately, I was making like really good money. I was in 11th grade and my aunt was the secretary for the high school. And she told me that um, because of being on the apprenticeship program, I only had to take gym class my senior year to graduate. So I decided to drop out of the program, only take <laughs> um, gym class my senior year. And then I started riding BMX bikes. And this is still a huge influence on my work. Um, you'll see that in some later slides. But this is me from about, man, probably like 12 years and 50 pounds ago. Um, <laughs> so uh, it's kind of interesting because I grew up working with clay. Oh. So these were the trails that me and my friends would build. Um, all hand built with shovels, would dig up the dirt. Um, so it's just been kind of fun to see the transition to still making functional objects like me and my friends were in the woods. Uh, my computer froze. Oh, there we go. All right, so um, another thing that, a similarity that when I started doing ceramics that I reminded me of um, riding bikes was the community. Like to keep a set of these trails running, you need a, a lot of friends, a lot of people to do it. Um, it's a lot like firing a wood kiln, having a pottery studio, running a place like Touchstone. You need that solid community around you to keep everything going um, and running smooth. But around this time, I had a pretty bad injury and I met my wife and her dad was a potter. And um, he, we went into his studio one day and just messed around. And um, I started taking classes at a community college. Um, this was my first professor. His name's Jerry Denon. He lives in Pittsburgh. Um, I'm sorry if any of you actually know him. <laughs> but looking back at his work now, I could see where a lot of the patterns and repetition comes in. I don't know if you can see me, but like on this piece, just a lot of that texture is still coming back into my work. And he's just been a huge influence on me. Um, then also Joe Delphia, he was a studio tech at the time and he would take me to fire wood kilns with him um, out at um, Laurelville Church Center. They had the uh, wood kiln. 
so he just really got me into it and um they both kind of pushed me to leave the ccac in pittsburgh and go to edinburgh university so um i see travis's eyes there <laughs> um i don't know if you've ever been to edinburgh but it pretty much looks like this nine months of the year um but it was really nice because there's not many distractions just a lot of studio time uh, while well, I was there, I got to study under Lee Rexrow, Chuck Johnson, and Linda Cordell, and which was really nice to have um, three professors that made completely different work. So I was there for three years and then stayed an extra year as a studio tech. And at the end of my time there, this was the work that I was making. It was um, soda-fired porcelain. Um, I didn't really know the meaning behind the work, a lot of it was just copying other artists. A lot of it was being intuitive. Um, so I really wanted to go to graduate school to have three more years to really um, find reason into why I'm making what I'm making. And it was definitely one of the best deci decisions I could have made. Could have made. Um, so I went to Southern Illinois University at Edwardsville, which um, is a pretty interesting campus. It's a commuter campus. It's on 150 acres. So um, one of the nice things is once you were on campus, it was, um, there weren't many distractions. There's a lot like Edinburgh. You don't want to go outside because of the snow here. I mean, it was nice to go walk around the hiking trails, but a lot of it, you just had a lot of focused studio time. Uh, while I was there, I got to study under Paul Drasang. Um, so I don't know if you could see the pointer, but the, Handbag in the top right, that's actually Cone 10 salt-fired porcelain, which is um, just blows my mind. Um, but he was also one of the most um, prolific potters I ever met. I'd go in the studios. On, he was a student of Warren McKenzie. And I'd go in the studio. It'd be Sunday morning, like 7 a.m., just excited. And you walk in, and you just hear the treadle wheel clicking away come around the corner and Paul just has a table full of pots and he'd just look at you and say slacker and just like put your head down and walk into your studio. Um, then I also had Joe Page, um, which his first year of teaching there was my first year. And he's a pretty big like concept, conceptual um, installation artist. And um, I didn't know how it was gonna work with him, like not making many pots. Um, if you look in these clouds here, there's like one little slip, cl slip cast cloud, and that's the only clay like in the show. So um, wanting to make functional pots, it was definitely um, kind of interesting and um, trying to figure out like how it was gonna be, but he was the most supportive person I've had along the way so far. Um, he collected a lot of pots and he went to Elford with a lot of really good potters and um, yeah, just, really nice to have him as a professor in school so um these are some of the really bad pots that i had made my <laughs> first year of grad school well first semester um probably first year um i was like overthinking it thinking i was going to go to graduate school and just have this immediate change that everything in my work was going to do 180 you know just like find what i was going to be making and I overthought it and I probably only went through like a couple of hundred pounds my first year. Like I thought I was going to get kicked out of school because of it. Um, and then at the end of my first year, someone recommended me reading the book by, um, Oh man, what's his name? Michael Simon. It's called evolution. And he talks a lot about like learning through making. So my second year of school I actually went through a couple ton of clay instead of a couple boxes of clay. And um, I don't know if anyone's ever read that book, but it's definitely um, was very important to my graduate studies. Um, during my second year, I was introduced to a painter. His name's Wayne Tebold. And I really like the flatness of uh, his paintings, how they're just, um, there's not much depth to them. And that's something that still today that like is, um, I see in the surface of my pots. I think one of the biggest things that drew me to it is it reminded me of Pittsburgh. <laughs> um, just between the two, it's just like, I just see so many similarities um, between his paintings and this image of the city. Um, 
and I started playing around with the idea of um, screen printing images on my pots. So these are um, some of like the bridges from Pittsburgh. Uh, this is another piece that it's probably one of my first like more architectural pieces, but then using the bridges is um, to create a pattern. And I kind of got to the point where I realized just because Pittsburgh was important to me, didn't mean it was important to everyone else. Um, I'm still trying to grasp how people don't like it as much as I do. <laughs> Um, and another artist at the time that I started to really get into his work was um, Richard Diebenkorn. And um, at this point, I started really not relate comparing my work to his, but relating it to it. Where his earlier work was, um, you could see like objects and figures, but it's later in his career, it got a lot more abstract and it was based off of color fields. Um, where he was like focusing in on certain areas of the city. Um, so that this is the first piece to come from that. But I was like really into the idea of it, even though looking at it now, it just looks like a toaster. Um, but there was like something with the surface that wasn't really fitting. This was with slips and um, a clear glaze. So I started thinking about my past with riding bikes again and like, when we weren't in the trails, we were riding around the city um, in the winters or if it, the trails were too muddy. So like everything I was seeing was these old brick buildings, um, seeing photographs of my friends riding in the streets and that glossy pot just wasn't like wasn't coming through with what I was hoping it would. So that's when I started using Terra Gelata. And um, these were the first pieces that come from that, um, which I feel like it just really, um, represents a lot more of like what I was like visually thinking. Um, and then this kind of leads into my last semester of graduate school. Um, my thesis show is titled Hometown Perspectives. And the whole idea of it wasn't to make a pot as a pot, it was the show is more of an installation. And um, just your, the different views of the city. Um, so like if you're standing in the city looking out and you'd see Mount Washington building some shelving units that could um, kind of display the pots to represent that. Or even growing up and right near Touchdown, Falling Water um, is an influence how I could use, um, build shelving units to use like the idea of the nature and the vertical and horizontal planes that Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright would use. And then um, actually how like those, the forms I was making could influence the patterns on the pieces um or how pittsburgh's kind of unique and um it's surrounded by bridges and making little cup caddies that thinking of the containers being the bridges and the tumblers being the um cityscape held within um and then using other parts of the city like the cargo containers uh, stacking of them, the shape of the bridge to use on like the lid of the jar, just um, how I could just take everything from the city and just really get it into my pots. Um, so I was just looking at a lot of like the barges on the river and then using that to create patterns on some stack cups or a little shot glass tray, pretty much like kind of to represent like a little barge on the river taking its own containers. Um, then also finding beauty and imperfection. So the image on the left is a like the little biscuit they put in uh, plywood when it's messed up, like when there's like a little chunk taken out. And sometimes I'll add um, like little sprig molds on the right to cover up imperfections of the piece. Um, so up until this point, everything was about Pittsburgh. And then I started making this series of cups and I walked into the art building one day and the top photo was our act, like the art building where I was at graduate school. And um, it just kind of hit me. Like I was so disappointed in myself that I was letting my everyday surroundings influence my work and not just Pittsburgh. But um, it was also a good thing. Um, why are you stopped? There we go. So these are just a couple of the 
shots from my thesis show. Um, so just like thinking of the city, like um, like this would be like a cityscape, being, and then the bottom being mirrored into the river, and just the um, time of like the water eroding away at it. And then just a couple other views of doing some stacking vases to kind of um, copy off of that same idea of the like city skyline. This piece, um, it was titled 16 Pla <laughs> Platters. <laughs> Um, but just um, use it, making the platters hanging them on the wall and using um, the pattern on it to create another pattern within the pieces. And then I don't know if it's covered up, but if you look down in the bottom right corner, there was a what is it like a voodoo doll or something like that when I set up my show, and it was just like there, and I did not like want to move it, thinking like it knocked the platters off the wall. And I showed this image in my um, slide talk for a couple of years before I re realized it was actually like in the image. Um, but that was just a shot of like just thinking about like the layering of cities and the layering of my pots. Um, another part I left out was through all of this, I got to go to graduate school with my wife. Um, she's a metalsmith. So we met at community college. We both transferred to Edinburgh University. We both went to graduate school together. And then we both did a residency together. Um, and our thesis show opening was the same night. So that was just something um, just really cool to be able to like go through all that time and then be able to celebrate it together. Um, it was really nice too. A bunch of friends drove up and surprised me at the show. Some of them driving like four to five hours to be there. Um, so then afterwards, I knew I was in school for so long. Um, probably like nine years at this point that I knew I didn't want to go straight into teaching. Um, I wasn't ready to, to settle down. I thought moving to Pittsburgh and setting up a home studio would be the easy thing to do. I really wanted to like challenge myself some more. Um, so my wife and I were both accepted as residents at Pocosin Arts School of Fine Craft, which is in Columbia, North Carolina. It's about an hour south of here. It's um. A really interesting town because it's about 800 people um but it was just nice much like where i went to undergrad and grad school there weren't many distractions so i just got a lot of studio time um we both had studios downtown downstairs in the building on the right and then we lived in an apartment um right above it uh so while i was there that's when i really started getting into the process that i'm using now with the plaster press molds and um, centering on the wheel. I worked with it a bit in graduate school and um, it, I had a critique at the end of my third semester and the professors told me that they think I um, just like, like there was nothing left with the idea that I was just like, did it too much, I should move on. But me being in school, I kind of took it the wrong way um up until this point i only had three molds to make my cups mugs jars bowls plates and they were telling me to make more molds um but i was just taking it like um they wanted me to move on from the process so whenever i got to the residency i was like they can't tell me what to do so i started doing it again and then shortly after i talked to joe and he was just really surprised and they always wondered why i stopped using the molds um just kind of funny. I guess in school you overthink everything. Um, but not being in, around the city, I really got into like looking at everything that was around me. So this was the roof in the ceramic studio at Picosan. Um, just some like sewer drains that were around. And then started thinking about like when we were riding bikes, like the forms that I could use and how I can combine all of that to create a piece. Um, and then just, this was during Pittsburgh and Sika, just walking around the city and really taking like close-ups of stuff where a lot of, like everything up until that point was more based off of the, um, like, I guess they were close-ups, but more of the cityscape. Um, but wondering how I could just add more detail to my work. 
and then these were the pieces that came from that, just adding a lot more texture um, and similar pat like patterning. And then this, I switched to the brown clay at this point too, to reference like all the rusted bridges in the city. Um, and I used this clay during my time at Picosum. Um, just like a smaller version of like, I guess it's like our downtown from the photo of um, Picosum, it was just a lot smaller scale than like full city. So um, just thinking of making like smaller pieces and smaller scale to represent that. Um, then at times it felt like my pots just lived in the building. Um, this was like one of the walls and tables in the building and one of the pieces that I've made. Um, so we were residents there for about 14 months. We were gonna stay for a second year. And then my wife got a job teaching seventh grade art in Elizabeth City. Um, so we decided to buy a house. <laughs> um, this is the house we got. We live an hour north of Picosum. And I still teach there once a week um, and switch to online since everything's um, been crazy the last couple months. Um, so if you're not sure where Elizabeth City is, that's us way over on the right side. We're about 40 minutes from the Outer Banks. Um, it's kind of nice. In about 45 minutes, you can, um, we can have our beach chairs planted at the beach and um, just something I'm not used to living in Pittsburgh or St. Louis. Um, I'm not sure if you can see my pointer, but where the pointer is, that's where Picosin is. So we're only 25 miles away by boat, but to drive there, you have to drive all the way around, which takes an hour. Um, so it's just kind of interesting place to live in the country. Um, so when we bought the house, this is what my studio had looked like. Um, like when we got it. And this is what it looked like this morning. So um, my dad came down and we built a shed on the left since I took the shed over as a studio. We still needed a place for shed stuff. Um, but then the right side is most, um, where I'm sitting right now. So in the top and bottom, that's kind of some before and afters. Um, so the top left and the bottom left is the exact same view of the space and you can kind of see like it's pretty run down. I had to replace a lot of two by fours, um, resupport the ceiling, insulate it, run hundred amp power out to it, but it's a pretty big project. It seems like Travis is starting to go through this process. Um, and then now just some inspiration in some of my newer pieces. I'm still looking a lot back at um, when I was riding BMX bikes, probably just cause I'm too old and fat to do it now. Um, but like the tires on the left were like the tires that I rode for years. And then on the right, I always wore Vans shoes and they're known for like the checkered patterning. Um, and then on the left, just thinking of like the tire tracks going through and leaving all the textures. So on the right, that's kind of like my take on all of that, where there's like the white and gray checkers on it, the light blue and the blue or the, um, tire like the patterns that were on the tires and then all the texture behind it was like all the texture like on the photo on the left um, then just a couple more of the newer pieces um, just kind of combining all of that and I switched back to a red clay to be able to brighten the colors a little bit um, and have a little bit more grog to it so it's just um, some of the newest mugs from couple kilns ago and I think that's it so is that good <laughs> all right so we do have one question right off the bat what was the name of the book that you got really um, Michael Simon evolution <laughs> So I got it right here. And it's a lot of pictures. It's not a hard read. Um, <laughs> but it's kind of... Okay. Um, <laughs> Are you reading picture books? Yeah. No, he talks a lot about, like, you're not going to just make up, wake up one day and make good pots. 
Um, you got to make a lot of bad pots to learn from that to make a good pot. Um, so it's just really nice to, there's like a lot of things that like I've always had in my head, but I just never like knew how to express them. Like as I was reading the book, it just kind of like, oh yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. So. Yeah. I mean, I think it's so hard to, I mean, what is good? I think that is such like a hard thing to even begin to wrap your head around is like, I mean, finding your voice in art, which I think you've done in a really amazing way. I mean, I've known you for so long and I mean, I've, I've, we connected immediately because we both like road bikes, you know, and I really like, I love that I can really see that coming into your newer pieces. Um, the question I have for you is like, I, I mean, knowing you and how your love for Pittsburgh, I <laughs> Uh, and how Pittsburgh based your work was for so long. Do you really see like, I mean, you've moved around a little bit now, kind of, do you see these other places that you've been now starting to creep up in your work a little bit more and kind of influence what you're doing? Oh yeah, for sure. That definitely started at Pocosin and um, being here, but um, I think over the last couple of months, just really switch kind of using like my BMX past. That's really been the biggest influence. And there's, um, I feel like there's so much to draw from it. It's kind of funny because um, when I was an undergrad at Edinburgh, we went to Wooster, the functional ceramic workshop. And I was talking to the Edinburgh alumni and we were at the bar one night drunk and I was just like, yeah, I want to like figure out ways to like tie my pots together and um, make it relate to um, like, my bike riding past and he just looked at me and shook his head and he's like yeah, that's a far stretch you can't do that and then after i started doing it i talked to him and he's like i was drunk i don't ever remember saying that and like, <laughs> so i think all through edinburgh i didn't try to do it because i was told it was too far of a stretch <laughs> but i was also so new to clay that i just listened to what anyone told me to do so. I mean, I think it's interesting. It's just like takes a while to kind of find your voice in what you make. And I think like you talking about, you got to make a lot of bad pots to make a good pot, you know, and it's like, you got to make a lot of work that's not really you to really find you at the same time, you know? Sure. I think it kind of comes with the more you make, the more kind of you start to fall into kind of these, you know, you really learn what you're interested in. I think it's a huge part of art. I mean, I noticed how you change from like showing like the large cityscape and kind of, and kind of zooming in and really starting to observe like the smaller detail that was kind of in the older work, but I don't think you focused on it as much, you know, then you started to really, oh, look at the building textures, look at the different, you know, even the tire textures and kind of things like that and kind of zooming in on the things that really almost kind of make those cityscapes in a way, you know? Yeah. And that's what, um, when you were asking me about like, you said it seems like my work has changed a lot um that came up with like my um thesis defense where professor paul is just like how are you going to keep evolving and it was like something i was immediately able to like relate to riding bikes where like we had our trails and you'd build a jump and you're scared of it and you're you jump it and then over time it just got easy so then you build it bigger until you weren't scared of it and like in my pots in a way, it's like I make so many and I just get tired of seeing them that I kind of like change it to, it's not that I'm building it bigger, but I'm like changing it to the point where I'm like not comfortable with what I'm making. And then once I start to get comfortable with it, then it's like, then I got to push it again. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a lot of, I mean, I did with, I had Taylor on this and we talked a lot about being kind of being scared, you know, like it's, even sometimes those little changes in your work that kind of seem to take a while to really like, you're like, oh, wow, I didn't think of this forever ago. Like, even though it was kind of obvious the change to make and kind of like, how, how do you like kind of overcome to the next step, which sometimes is pretty terrifying to actually like do, you know? Yeah. I think a lot of it's just making a lot of pots um, and just trying not to make too many of the same pot. Like a lot of my pots are similar with working from the mold, but um like when I was writing my thesis I was reading a few other like former graduate students thesis and um there's um like a quote in there from a professor before I got there just saying if you don't have a test in every kiln 
it's a waste of a kiln. So like I test a ton, like I'm probably on over like 10,000 test tiles right now on my notebook. Um, but I also think like is the pieces, like I don't sketch. So like I figure like a new form, a new shape, a new texture, a new pattern, new color combo is being um, a test that I need to have a couple of them in every kiln. Yeah, I mean, do you make a lot of work that people don't see? Um, I mean, I follow your work pretty closely. Do you like make things? I don't like it. <laughs> yeah, that you just like toss that no, the world doesn't see, you know? No, I mean, you never like my posts. Oh, get out of here. I, I probably have, well, I don't know anymore. I probably have one of the largest Mark Arnold collections. I'm definitely on the East Coast. I've got the beginning cups all the way to the new cup, so. I don't know. There was someone on here earlier. I don't know if she's still on here. Um, <laughs> but she has a pretty big collection of mine. <laughs> um, I don't know. No problem with you, but looks like I got to get some more pots from you then. Yeah. So we do got some questions coming in. The one is, uh, do you have a favorite form to make? If, um. Probably mugs, just because it's like it lets me sketch stuff out quicker. Um, I'm like completely OCD, and I make three of everything at a time. So I'll make like three mugs, and then do three slightly like off patterns. Um, plus, it's a, like an object that I just seen I can never make enough of. Yeah, I mean, you've always made a lot of mugs. I mean, it's something even being an undergrad, you always made a whole lot of mugs. I mean, and it's, it probably, you know, it's like one of those smaller objects that's probably a little less, I mean, do you think like making the larger objects takes a little bit more like brain space to kind of deal with and kind of work through? Is where mugs, you're just kind of like, helps you, like, lets you work through them a little quicker, kind of feel it out. And it's yeah, for sure. I think the other thing right now too is um, like when everything started shutting down, I really started working smaller because I didn't want to run out of clay. Um, so it's just, and then with shipping with online sales, definitely. Um, oh yeah, Audra, that's who has probably more of my couple or pots than you. <laughs> oh, Audra, come on now. Uh. Um, but yeah, it just, I don't know what I was saying there. I'm confused. <laughs> <laughs> no i love seeing like your work and talk uh, kind of about where it's kind of developed i think it's like a really nice pattern to kind of see i mean when i met you you were really interested in atmospheric firing and then you've kind of toned it down and i think you've really kind of found something that's a little you know it relates more to kind of you in a way you know and kind of your background i'm yeah. really interested to see like i don't know like how it really develops i feel like you have such a love for pittsburgh and that's how i know you is like hardcore <laughs> for Yinzer, for sure um and kind of if you know is the beach gonna start creeping up in your work like is that kind of the different textures and kind of stuff going on there gonna kind of start making a presence in your work as you kind of spend more time there i mean yeah there's definitely a point um when i first got here and started using the brown clay and a lot of colors were like the blues and yellows and greens they um they really look like a lot of the beach houses because of like all the old brown wood on them and then they're all painted super bright colors. I should probably put an image of that in my presentation. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, honestly, you might not even have thought about how it's starting to creep up in your work yet. I do think, yeah. you know, me personally, like environment it affects things so much i think that's the great thing about doing residencies and kind of moving about is kind of being in those new places and really how they influence you it almost takes i mean how long have you been in this new house you know i think it takes it takes like a year or two before you even realize how that place really started to affect you and your work right yeah i've been i think september would be two years in my studio september or october so yeah so you're probably just like oh yeah this is this is my life and it's kind of like, this is what it's about. And I think, you know, you grew up in Pittsburgh. I think having that background so hard, is like, I mean, I'm surprised all the pots aren't black and gold, but <laughs> you know, it's, you know, I kind of love seeing that. So, um, yeah, I don't know if anyone else has any questions. I know there was one question about if you had space in your workshop left. 
Yes. Um, I think they could fit up to 100 people in it or so. Um, so it's probably going to be a similar format to this where um, Marlene, she's the director of Picosin. She's going to kind of be a moderator and as I'm working, be able to answer questions for people. Um, well, depending on the number, um, we're going to see how that works. So. Yeah, and I know Mark is going to be teaching at Touchstone in 2021. Um, I don't know the date off my head yet at Touchstone Center for Crafts, which if you are interested in that class, definitely feel free to send us an email at Touchstone and we are going to create a wait list for him. And on the wait list, we're going to give everybody kind of first, first go at the class. So if you want to get in that class early, that's a one way to go about doing it. Um, Mark's a wonderful teacher. I think his process is something that is really awesome. I think I visited you when you started first started working with animals, actually, and it's it is fun. It's kind of funny how you ditched it and then came back to it. I think that's kind of awesome. So, yeah. Sorry, the dog just came. <laughs> <laughs> Perks of a doggy door. <laughs> so yeah, unless you know, I think that's pretty much wrapping it up. Um, do what I'm going to kind of talk a little bit about what we've got coming up on this series. Um, as I said, if you have questions for Mark, is there a good, I mean, if you want to type in your Instagram handle and maybe your, you know, any information you want to give out about yourself, for people to get a hold of you, I think would be great. Yeah. Um, definitely the Pocosin website. If people are interested in that, I think that would be great. Um, looks like Dean typed in the info at Touchstone Center for Crafts. If you're interested in his 2021 workshop. Mark was going to be out of Touchstone this summer, but unfortunately we had to go ahead and cancel it due to the current pandemic, but we are thrilled to have him coming back out in 2021. Um, so coming up on the series next week, we have Lindsay Ketterer Gates, who is actually our director at Touchstone, who makes absolutely wonderful work. So we're really excited to have her on there to talk about her work. I've been working with her for close to two years now and I've never seen her give a presentation on it. So I am thoroughly thrilled to kind of have her on and get to sit down and talk to her more about her work and kind of her process with her work. Um, after that, we, I think we are going to have Maya Lepo the following Friday, who is a metalsmith working out of Pittsburgh that makes wonderful steel jewelry. So that should be a great one. And after that, we got Michael Nashif lined up, who is another metal smith that makes really, really fabulous work and that will give a great talk. So if that's something you're interested in, I don't think the links are actually up on Touchstone's website yet to register for those, but they will be up within the next few, probably the next few days. So um, head over to Touchstone Center for Crafts or touchstonecrafts.org to kind of register for any of the upcoming talks. And thank you all for coming out and definitely a big round of applause from Mark coming out and giving us a tour of his studio, letting us see his work. Actually, I'm, you might want to say if you have any work available, because I'm sure there's probably lots of people here who would love to drink their coffee out of one of those beautiful Mark mugs. But if you have, if you have any of that, I know you've got a bunch of shows and stuff going on. If there's places for people to find your work, that'd also be kind of a great thing to kind of throw in there. Yeah, right now, um, um, everything I have is pretty much what's behind me, <laughs> um, which is pretty low. Normally, I have about um, three to four times that amount. So, um, but if anyone's interested in anything, just send me a message, and I'd be more than willing to send you some photos. All right. Thanks again, and thank you all for tuning in, and hopefully we'll see you next week. Thank you. It was great. Thanks for coming and watching. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all. It's great to see so many faces on here. Sleeping in on yours, too. I think she just disappeared. <laughs>